our, our next discussion uh, is with two people uh, who I will say I admire greatly. And I'm really grateful to uh, Prime Minister Jose Maria Aznar of Spain for making the trip in, especially for our conference. Um, president Aznar served as president of the government of Spain for eight years, and um, they've missed him since. And uh, on ver or virtually every metric that you can look at, whether it's economic, social, political, uh, he did an unbelievable job. And uh, we're, we're really honored that he's here. I'm, I'm personally very honored that um, he's a member of our editorial board. Uh, he's been a, a, a board member of our, our company uh, for a long time. And, and so you know, his accomplishments certainly speak for themselves. But I, I just want to say that President Aznar is the type of leader that we really are, I think, missing today. He's not only extremely intelligent and has great integrity, he's also a real moral leader who's never been afraid to take very courageous stances for what he thinks is right. So we're, we're very honored to have him here. Um, and I'm, I'm also really honored to have uh, Carl Theodore Zugutenberg, uh, who is, uh, was served as the youngest ever Minister of Economics and Technology and then the youngest Minister of Defense in Germany's post-war uh, era. And uh, KT also has spoken out on a lot of issues that are not always popular domestically. He's part of President Aznar's Friends of Israel Initiative, which is an amazing organization of uh, world leaders who uh, attempt to prevent the delegitimization of the state of Israel, regardless of people's political views. But uh, KT, incidentally, recently did make a, uh, a speech during the recent elections, um, and that was rumored to mark his return to, to politics. And I think given that Angela Merkel has to step down at some point. It would be great for the world if we were sitting here with the future chancellor of, uh, of Germany. And I'll just say this would be a very, this is a very good forum to announce these kinds of candidacies. Should, should the, should the <laughs> and I'm also very grateful, of course, to Jacob Weisberg, the editor in chief of Slate, who's gonna moderate the conversation. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I think just there and there. Yeah. Well, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That worked. Perfect. Uh, well, I want to thank uh, Richard for uh, convening this interesting day, and uh, also for the honor of, of moderating the uh, panel with these two distinguished Atlant Atlanticists. And um, the difficulties of Atlanticism are the theme we're going to be talking about. But I wanted to start. First, by talking a little bit about news in both of your countries, um, difficult news around the German election and around the Catalan referendum. And I'll start with you, Prime Minister. Um, I think people better, here... Better start with Germany. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think better with Spain. <laughs> I don't think you need time to think about it. I think you've, you've thought about it plenty. Um, but. Um, uh, obviously, many people were distressed to see uh, violence being used in, in relation to this referendum, even if the legality of it was, was dubious. And we're all wondering what's going to happen now. But the question for you is, did the government, and this is the government of, of your successor, Mariana Rajoy, handle this in the best way? And, and what, should, what should be done now? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Richard, and uh, all the best for the, this uh, forum. Well, the situation is very complicated, very difficult, because it's, it's, uh, it's unthinkable to imagine a worse situation in a country that uh, in the time that one part of the country trying to, 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 to separate, to, to organize a secession or a rebellion against the rest of the country. No? You and uh, here in the US, your history, is in, in a part a consequence of the secession. <laughs> when the Confederated States declared secession, the reaction of the president in the moment, Lincoln, was to intervene, not accept the secession, not accept the decision of the Confederated States. And uh, the consequence was the US, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> fortunately. But uh, President Lincoln uh, was uh, totally decided to pay the price. He paid the price huge price, 
but the US exists. Well, I think all the processes of secession are similar. Not exactly in the tools, but they are similar. We are living in Spain a coup d'etat, a rebellion. The authorities, official authorities in, in, um, in Catalonia is in an illegal situation. Uh, they don't accept the Spanish legality. They don't accept the constitutional legality. They, they, act, they, they act outside of the legal situation in Spain. This is totally unacceptable. And all the, they are, have crossed all the rain lines that exist in our constitutional system. Our, the, the situation is more complicated to understand because the leaders of the rebellions continue to be and act every day without consequences for uh, its acts and these decisions. To imagine the major leader of this uh, rebellion is the, the equivalent of the governor of Catalonia, of the, co the governor of Catalonia continue to be governor in Catalonia. The people don't understand this. And personally, I don't understand. <laughs> it's very complicated to understand. Second, some people, there are cross lines, and you must to respect the constitutional order in Spain. Okay. Se and not accept any kind of secession in the country. Second, some people propose now a constitutional reform, trying to establish a mechanism to attract secessionism. I think this is a serious mistake. There is not possibility to attract secessionism. A secessionist want to be secessionist. Want the secession. No want to be the belief in a uh, constitutional uh, new system in uh, in Spain. No? But with attention with this question, because the, the I, I, I agree with a, a constitutional reform to reinforce. The, the powers of the state to reinforce the central powers. But it's indispensable that the national government react and act. If not, things can be more complicated. But the situation is, in my view, totally unacceptable. Is there, Prime Minister, is there a legal process that you would accept or recognize for a legitimate secession in Catalonia, because this will set a precedent not just in Spain, but around, around Europe for other secessionist movements. No, it is, it is very dangerous as well for Europe, because uh, very dangerous for, for Spain as well, for other regions, and very dangerous for other regions of Europe. If you accept uh, a coup d'etat, if you accept that the illegality is, can, uh, can live in without consequences, if you act, uh, the, uh, if, you, if you accept the consequences of, of the coup d'état, the, the situation is very dangerous in, in, in Europe. Everybody, in Italy and in UK, in, in, in a lot of countries in Europe. No? And, uh, and this possibility to live in a disintegration of uh, the European Union is a possibility. Right? Yeah. And nationalism is uh, one of the worst expressions of the political problems in Europe. Mm -hmm. no? And unfortunately, we live in, in, in this mix of nationalism and populism that it is not a better way to try to resolve problems. But I hope that we are uh, all nations, one of the historical nations in Europe, and uh, in other difficult times we have survived, and uh, we will survive now. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um. Katie, uh, well, secessionist movement is one is one issue Germany doesn't doesn't face, as far as I know. Never underestimate the Bavarians. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're Bavarian. Yeah, yeah Bavarian. Uh, um, but um, as Richard said, you're just back from spending several weeks campaigning um, for Angela Merkel, in whose cabinet you served as as uh, defense minister. Um, the the news coming out of the election here was that the AfD, the far right party, performed beyond previous benchmarks and is joining the parliament, I believe, for the first time since the Second World War. What, uh, what explains this shocking development? 
Well, it's not the AFD that's joining the parliament the first time. It's a far-right extremist party that's joining the, uh, right, the Bundestag the first time since the Second World War, which is on an, honestly a very worrisome development. Right. It is analogous to what Jose Maria has just laid out. It is nationalist connotations that play an enormous role in this regard. People felt attracted by those who would concentrate their messages, mainly looking inward. The AFD emerged out of a anti-Euro movement. So it started to be, it's, it, they started to be a party that may, was mainly skeptical towards everything coming from Brussels and to the Eurozone as such as well. And from there, it was a, an astoundingly quick step towards becoming a party that would use any nationalist imaginations that were somehow flaring the horizon. And then, of course, in connection with the refugee crisis, they had a, a, a cynical playing field, which they used quite sophisticatedly. And of course, they drew many, many, many voices from the so-called conservative parties in Germany that were not capable of dealing with this new wording, first of all, properly. But it would be too, it would be too easy just to say they drew from them. They actually, had, they actually had votes from the whole political spectrum and the whole voter spectrum in Germany, even from the far left, people that were just fed up, and we've heard that in other Western countries around the world as well, fed up of the so-called establishment. And, and so that explains a lot. And we have to take one thing into account here as well. The 12, or the shockingly high, 12 to 13 percent of the AFD are not all voters that would subscribe to the idiocies and, and, and the lunacies these guys propose. It's 60%, 60 to 65 percent of the voters voted them out of protest and out of protest towards the established players. And so it, it feeds into a development where Germany at least pretended to be somehow immune to for the last few years, at a time when we already had these movements in France, when we had them in Belgium, when we had them in the Netherlands, when we had them in Poland, where a nationalist government is in place, in Hungary, where a nationalist government is in place, and suddenly we have it in Germany as well. Still, only, quote, unquote, 12 percent, but 12 percent. And the so-called new lender in the new states in the East, they made it up to 22, 23 percent, which is uh, quite of concern. Far-right parties in Eastern Europe have had support, covert support from Russia, which has intervened in the elections, obviously following what happened in our election here, where we're now uh, in this process of trying to determine the, the extent and the specifics of the Russian intervention. There was great concern about the French election and the German election about covert Russian intervention. It doesn't appear based on what I've seen, that the Russians were as active in the German election. Do you think that's the case? It was definitely less than feared or predicted. Mm. And that, but that doesn't keep us from the, um, from, 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 from the wider picture that this AFD party has close connection to Moscow. And they're tightly interconnected with many other players within Europe. So the way they used during their campaign all the means of social media now, all these things followed a certain pattern, a pattern we've seen before. That's one point. The other point, direct Russian intervention. Not in the weeks before the election. And that may have many, many reasons. One is that the guy in the Kremlin, who can certainly spell self-confidence correctly, was probably more happy with the idea of someone he doesn't utterly like, but who, whom he can somehow predict. So keeping Angela Merkel in place might have been in his wider scheme. At the same time, they're doing everything to foster disunity within the European Union. And what could be better than creating an unstable environment in Germany? And that's exactly what we have now, right now. They are forming now, most probably, a four-party coalition, the first time in history. That's not a two-party coalition. Stability is something else. And what I hear now from some people who are involved in the matters of looking into potential Russian interventions is that they say they were clever enough to see that there were 30% undecided voters 
still a few days before the election. So the best days to interfere, and it's not even expensive, are actually the last two days. And nobody has thoroughly looked into that yet. <clears throat> and it was quite interesting to see that we had, we, had, we had outgoing early polls on this Sunday of the election where the CDU, CSU, the conservative parties were still at 35, 36%. And in the evening, suddenly down at 32, 32, 33, which is more than the typical margin you would have on such a day. So there are some at least rumors flowing around that they might in the meantime be clever enough to use the, that some, the, 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 the turmoil of an election day to even then interfere because the people are undecided up until the moment they go to the ballot. Hmm. Prime Minister Esnar, have you seen the hand of the Kremlin in events in Catalonia or elsewhere in Spanish politics? I'm not going to blame Mr. Putin of the, our problems in Catalonia. <laughs> <laughs> I can blame him of other problems, but uh, <laughs> you know, the, the intervention of, uh, of Russia, of Russia, in the in the domestic um, policy or, or politics in, in different countries is, is traditional. In the times of the Soviet Union. What, it, what means the, the Communist Party? The Communist Party is the party of the Soviet Union in, in, in different parties. It's an intervention in, in, in the And now, with the, actuals, uh, with the um, behavior of Mr. Putin, is to change, to, to, to intervene uh, with different movements, nationalist movement, populist movement that, that then support, and they're trying to take advantage of this, uh, of this moment of confusion in, in, in Europe. No? And uh, maybe yeah, they lack a very serious goal, the lack of project in the in the in the for the European leaders today, is an advantage for Mr. Putin. No? That is continue to be uh, one of the most important as challenges for 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 European uh, stability and uh, for the future of the security in Europe. Going to the question of of this panel, I want to ask both of you whether we are seeing the end of Atlanticism or. On the other hand, are we simply seeing the rise of a different kind of Atlanticism, an illiberal Atlant Atlanticism based on shared views between uh, Trump supporters in this country and opponents of Europe, opponents of the European idea, opponents of immigration? Is there the same connections between our countries but based on a different kind of politics? I am. An Atlantis is convinced. If, if you let me say, I am totally Atlanticist. <laughs> <laughs> and I defend the necessity of this uh, Atlantic alliance, maybe now more than ever. Maybe now more than ever. But uh, we needed the, the, the Atlantic alliance for our stability, our security, our freedom, our institutional system, our democracy. And uh, we needed to, uh, to reinforce to reinforce this alliance. We needed to, to change a lot of things, because the, one of the most important expression of the, 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 the key expression of the alliance is NATO. But NATO must be transformed, mm. not continue to be in a in a continuity that is the expression of a, a, to be a marginal organization in the in the in the world of Earth. No, we must to tra transform NATO. And, uh, and to confront the challenges of the of the of the of the days. No, this is not the end of the Atlanticism. We must to redefine the the, the the Atlanticism and consider that the Atlanticism is totally basic for the security and stability uh, uh, of the world. It is very impressive the history of the Atlantic Alliance. In the history of uh, of politics, there is none exist ever a similar case of success as the success of, the, of, the, of NATO. We must keep in this spirit this way and transform. So how does Europe deal with an American president who put in the most charitable way doesn't see the value of NATO, but honestly is, is, is not a supporter of but NATO? The, the story of the, of, the, of the US and Europe in, in terms of NATO is, is the story of, of a, of, of, of a crisis, but different. We are living in different crises for different reasons. But the, the expression of the will to keep in NATO is uh, to keep in the, the, the Atlantic values are, are prevail always. No, and I think is uh, the, the situation are similar. You can say 
well, you are right to, to tell uh, and to say that the ally, European allies must to pay more, in, in order to make more contribution to the uh, command defense, to the security, and so on. OK, but you must be clear that the, the US remains commitment with the clauses of, of NATO, a commit, a, a, in, in a very serious commitment with the allies of, of, of uh, European allies. No? And then we must maybe to expand this to other, to other parts of the world, no? maybe in Australia or Japan or Israel or some countries in Latin America. KT, it would be nice if the president saw it that way, but he seems to see NATO like a bad trade deal that he both he, he thinks we're overcharged, but beyond that, he simply doesn't seem to see value coming from it. It has a lot to do with the ability to also read a history of an institution correctly, but um, as reading is probably not one of his. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Um, I entirely agree with, with what has been said before. And regarding NATO, one also has to, and that's, that's maybe this little trade element that could come into, into the wider game is NATO, if you want to see it cynically as a trade-off, was a pretty good trade-off for the US as well <coughs> in the last decades. In a, way, well. in a way that it fostered and it strengthened America's appearance and influence globally quite significantly. And not only due to the means the Americans put into NATO, which always will, way more than the marginal parts the European partners paid for it, but also by being surrounded by other allies who stood for credibility bridges into parts of this world where the US has had and has its difficulties. So that was one of the things you could see as as, as a, an element that needs to be discussed thoroughly, clearly, but with the right message between the heads of state and the heads of government in Europe, the NATO partners and this president, and specifically those who have read their history books and still, and still advise him and hopefully advise him for time to come whether they call him more on yes or no. It's, uh, we need some of those there. So that's one thing. The other thing more general on the transatlantic future, I'm entirely with you, we need a redefinition and probably also a renewal of this transatlantic partnership. It is not enough just to build on romanticism, on nostalgia, and to keep rephrasing our, yes, shared values. But we have refrained for decades, way before Trump, from a in-depth discussion about, yes, what are our shared values, but where do we differ? And there are quite a lot of fields where we differ quite significantly. And this is part of also a discussion in the spirit of friendship, but to come to something which is more attractive than just looking back. And the younger generation, you don't get any longer by just giving them the the idea of a peace dividend, by giving them the idea of, yes, changed efforts to be part of a wider framework in this world, you have to connect it to topics they really, they really care about. And this is not only security. One of, the, one, of, one of the fields where I have a lot of harsh discussions over here in the US is climate change. One of the, one of the topics we have to talk about is a trade framework an open markets framework that, yes, differs from what we hear from the White House right now, but also that differs from what we hear out of some European countries in that regard. And what we probably need is not just in an old transatlantic generation, but characters who are independent enough, like the prime minister here, like others, and on this side over here as well, that are willing to go this extra mile to shape and discuss something that is not just the thing we are used to. And do we have to do it now? Yes, there's a tendency in Europe to say, we'll wait it out. This guy will be gone in three years, maybe in seven years. Let's just wait it out. That's the worst thing that could happen. If there is a time to renew and to redefine a transatlantic relationship, then it's now with the same minds over here. And there are many. There are still many. 
And we have to reach out not only to the capital, we have to reach out to the states here, we have to reach out to the governors, and vice versa. They have to reach out to us as well because it's in their core interest also to keep the um, strongest trade relationship alive, the strongest economic relationship globally alive, but you have to renew it again and again and again. Last point on that, it's of course hard also from a European perspective because we are more fragmented than ever. And we are also in urgent needs of reform in the European Union. And I sometimes use this picture, if you look at the European Union, you get the impression of a patient on an operating table and 28 minus one, probably 27, very distinctly talented doctors standing around this operating table. And once in a while, someone stumbles over the plug of the hard lung machine. And the patient starts to groan. You'll always find someone pushing the plug back into the wall. And the only reaction you get is the patient is alive, thank God. But the patient's still a patient and also not reformed. So I'm quite hopeful that we could still, with all the difficulties we have now in Germany and in other places, we could still get something on the road with Macron now in France and a couple of other characters to finally have a discussion about the future of Europe plus Atlanticism that has its initial face in Europe because we have a weak president over here when it comes to international questions. So two major European crises, the, the, the Euro crisis and the refugee crisis, have both subsided in the sense that they're not pulling the plug out of the, the, the wall for the patient right now, but neither of them has gone away. And I wanted both of you to comment on how people should be thinking now about the stability of the Euro and also about refugees looking forward to, to next season. Uh, <coughs> I was founder member of the, of the Euro. And uh, in my time, in, when I was prime minister or president of Spain, we entered in the Euro, in the foundation moment of the Euro. And since the, 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 the beginning of the Euro, I listen a lot of crises are, uh, relating with the Euro. We are living very complicated um, times, but the Euro exists. And, uh, and, uh, and the rules that uh, the manage the Euro are re relatively clear. We must to do something more, mm -hmm. but the Euro, I, I, I think you, you must to take her, you, you must to do, do something more, but the Euro exists against all odds and uh, a lot of opinions in, in, in the world. And the second question is the, the, the question of refugees. The question of refugees is very complicated. We Europeans don't like to intervene in the origin of the problems. I don't like to accept the consequences of not intervening in the origin of the problems. I don't like anything. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem in politics. But refugees is a problem. Bad manage for different people. And to establish a security in the uh, external borders of the European Union is totally essential. If not, we have, according with the last report of the chief uh, of uh, Interpol, we have 50,000 uh, jihadists move, moving freely across the borders in Europe, uh, across the, our countries in Europe. This is a situation for, for our security very, very dangerous. No? And don't forget that in the last months, every week in Europe, we have suffered an incident or terrorist attack in different countries. And uh, we're thin. I know what is to be politically correct relating with the question of refugees, but I must to establish very two clear rules. One, is necessary external control borders. Second, is uh, necessary to, to have a more major commitment to fighting terrorism. No? And, and some people that is um, under the, this uh, condition of uh, refugees are relations very complicated mm. with different terrorist organizations. I would, I would add the point that we have to engage more at the places where the roots of terrorism are being developed. That sounds banal, but that's one of the things where Europe shied away f for years now, for decades. 
And of course, we were always happy that we had a partner, back to transatlanticism, that did some dirty work for us. And we in Germany established for that the, um, the term of what we are doing is the checkbook diplomacy. Mm. And so that has changed a bit. And one could ironically say that the new president over here led to something which the, the chancellor described, funnily enough, in a Bavarian beer tent after the G7 meeting. When she came back from the G7 meeting and said the outcome, or let's say the main, the main take for me of this G7 meeting with these new players there, is that we have to take our destiny in our own hands more and more now, our European destiny. Firsthandedly, one could say this is bad news for Atlanticism because it could lead to further departure from each other. I think it actually is the opposite because it's something which has been demanded from over here since a long time, that Europe becomes a more active player when it comes to our own borders, when it comes to things that cause refugees. And is it the last refugee crisis we have seen? No, definitely not. We'll see them coming and coming and again. And one of the, the places we tend to ignore on this side of the Atlantic and on our side of the Atlantic is the continent of Africa. We tend to look a lot to the Middle Eastern conflicts, which we will have for generations probably. But in Africa, we're talking about 40% of world's population in about 20 years to come with not many perspectives. And the only magnetism they have right now, they see right now, is Europe. And that's one of the things we have to get a grip on. And that will lead, coincidentally, also to hopefully more spendings regarding our defense approach and all the other things. And this is how we can tie the things together. So um, I'm still hopeful. But it needs also a new generation of politicians that are willing to go this way. Uh, tell me yeah. one thing. I, I read uh, a few days ago uh, history relating with um, uh, city, a small city in, in Germany. That is very, very expressive of this question. In the school of the city, attend the school of the city, two Germans and 50 Syrians. Yeah. One, the mother of one of the German, <laughs> uh, girl German that attend, the, make this the same, uh, Make the, 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 this question. Who make the integration here? Yeah. Good luck with that. Who make the integration here? Mm. Yeah. Are Germans in the integration in the Syrian system, <laughs> cultural system, or are Syrians in the integration in the German system, no? cultural? It is, it is more than an anecdote, because it's the real life in, in, uh, in, uh, in different parts of Europe today. We're, we're open for questions now, um, but uh, while, uh, do I see any hands? While well, I'm waiting for them, I have one more, which is to um, uh, say something briefly about the Brexit negotiation. Um, <laughs> I've taken the view that um, Brexit will never happen. I don't know how it won't happen, but I, th I think that it, w it will never, never be fully implemented, and it's sort of hanging in the balance right now. I don't know how it will happen. Yeah. And uh, not only how it won't happen, it's, and, and I am more and more skeptical as well. They are drifting apart from each other. I think it is correct that the European Union, at least in this point, shows a certain amount of unity, and that they are not opening the gates for others to follow by compromising at a stage where the other part is weakened out of many other reasons whether at a convention the letters fall down behind Theresa May's speech or name it whatever the reasons are. I think currently we are in a, in, in a situation that is not any longer about hard and soft Brexit, but about the question whether we have an endless Brexit or someone, <laughs> someone being, being a successor of a weak prime minister in the UK right now coming to new conclusions. And I wouldn't exclude any longer that we, we are in an entirely different situation in one or two years from now. I think it's an entire illusion to expect that in 2019 we'll have, this, we'll have, this, we'll have the things in place that, are, that need to be in place according to the rules. And so rules might be rewritten at such a point. It's, it's of course, the worst 
the worst situation imaginable right now for the European Union. The question is who is actually negotiating. We have with uh, Barnier, someone in, in Brussels who does an excellent job here, but all the others are somehow behind the scenes. Germany is not taking a position for the next three to four months to come because they're in their coalition talks within four parties. Um, France, of course, wants to step up. Spain is in a situation it is right now. So forming something out of this is quite a task. And um, I, I've never been good with predictions over years, but I'm really skeptical that we will see the Brexit the way it was actually intended to be. No, I think Brexit is a very bad business for UK and very bad business for Europe as well. No? But this is a decision of the Britons. <laughs> but this, this, this question can happen if you ask the people and the people can respond uh, for different reasons, not for the reason of uh, European question. But immigration is one of the reasons of the Brexit. But, uh, but I, I think it will be a very bad business, a very complicated negotiations. And I totally agree with, uh, with, with Carl. I can add that without a stable government in Germany, it will be very complicated to advance in the negotiations until there is non-exist uh, stable, stable government in, in Berlin, to advance in the negotiation will be al almost, uh, almost impossible. Mm. And Berlin is an Iranian bazaar for the next three months to come. <laughs> it's, uh, I see a hand uh, there. Sir, yes. Microphone coming. Thank you very much. Um, we had a panel this morning talking about the Middle East, and we didn't discuss Turkey. Yeah, Turkey you is can, a, Turkey. You Turkey. Can speak loud, Turkey. Yeah, we didn't yeah, discuss Turkey. Turkey this morning in the Middle East panel. Um, Turkey is an important uh, part of NATO. Yeah, and what challenge do you see for the Americans and for Europe um, with Turkey being a NATO partner going forward? Yeah, that's also a question of Atlanticism for me. I'm the question just to repeat, if anyone didn't hear it, is essentially how are we going to deal with Turkey? Yeah, again, it's the question whether we deal with Turkey with one voice or whether we are split here as well with a or many European voices and one American voice. I'm quite concerned about the latest developments in the U.S.-Turkish relationship. The German-Turkish relationship is at its worst since, since probably 20 to 30 years, mainly due to the behavior we see from Ankara, it's, um, in the meantime, they're taking even Germans as hostages and asking for exchange of, of refugees from Turkey in Germany. So this is just one example. Others, they wouldn't allow the NATO partner Germany, their parliament members, to visit their troops that are stationed in Turkey. And the most interesting part of, of let's say, the, um, the, 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 the turmoil we've seen so far was the ongoing attempt of Turkish politicians to campaign in Germany. So imagine Angela Merkel campaigning in Antalya, where a lot of Germans are over the summer break. Unthinkable. So all this led to, led to, a, led to a wording and to a situation where Turkey currently has lost any perspective for European membership, European Union membership, and there is a lot of commonalities amongst the European member states. Here you can draw, or here you can pull the plug. Where you cannot pull the plug is when it comes to NATO. There is no mechanism in place. And here we are back at real politics. I'd see it as a disaster if we would lose Turkey, as difficult as it is right now, as a security partner. But there has to be a discussion at a point when a nation of, or when a group of democratic member states has one member at one point that turns into dictatorship. Now we are in an autocratic, almost dictatorship-like situation in Turkey. That we are not just cynically saying, well, let's still embrace them because we need them. There needs to be some kind of a discussion that goes further than that. And that has not taken place yet. And uh, Germany can be, and effectively is, the most important country in the European Union, in Europe. But Germany can be, and is. Turkey 
cannot be the most important country in the European Union. And this is the very important difference. <laughs> Because uh, once, uh, in, in a meeting with the former Chancellor Kohl, we were talking about this question regarding Turkey, and uh, he told me, Turkey, I will not accept ever Turkey as a member of the European Union. And I asked him why. It is very simple, because Europe is a Christian club. And uh, it's a very interesting response, very interesting answer. You can to be agree or disagree, but don't forget the European roots. And uh, one of the, my disagreements with uh, some uh, very important members of the Bush administration some years ago is relating with this question. I defend very special relations with Turkey, very close relations with Turkey in terms of security, but become, Turkey became member of the European Union. It is totally in, uh, unthinkable. And, and, and impossible, uh, politically and culturally. This is my view. The problem is the more agnostic we are with our own culture, yeah. the harder it is to keep that level alive. Uh, uh, Cecil Morgan, then the front row. Yes. yes, hi, Prime Minister. Thank you for your comments on Catalonia. Uh, it's such a, a disturbing situation there. I mean, I hate to even ask this question, but do you think there's a possibility of, of the of the environment devolving into one of, of violence and, and civil strife. Are you a journalist? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but give the same answer you would have. <laughs> <laughs> Says the journalist. <laughs> <laughs> really, I don't know. But uh, there is non-exist a process of secession in the history of the politics without violence. There is none exist. You can put different examples in different countries, different periods, different centuries, none exist. This is, this is the risk. This is the dangerous situation that created for nationalists and secessionists that divides society, confronting families, confronting individuals and uh, establish a necessity to excluding the rest of the people. This is very bad and we can exclude some uh, exercise of uh, violence for the more radicals in the, in the part of the secessionism. No. But I hope things uh, are going well, but uh, the history, history is history. It is non exist precedent without some kind of violence for the people that not respect the uh, constitutional system. Can we have one more quick question, I think? Um, yes, right there. This is the last one, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you. I'll try to be quick. There's a question to uh, Minister uh, to Gutenberg. You have correctly stated that I think part of the solution to the uh, strengthening of Atlanticism is to strengthen Europe and the unity of Europe as well. Germany has been, at least from the outside, um, been a bit of a riddle as to their stance with respect to strengthening the institutions of European Union, uh, with respect to sort of fiscal rectitude, with respect to sort of uh, centralizing some more functions. How do you see the possibility for some of the uh, elements of Mr. Macron's vision, for instance, being supported by Germany uh, in general and now, especially in light of this relatively unstable uh, coalition that uh, has to be formed. Excellent point. So, first of all, good news is that Macron's speech had a co-speech writer sitting in Berlin. <laughs> That's rarely been observed over here because it's worthwhile looking into his speech and to see what's not part of his speech. A lot of the European ideas he had laid out during the campaign did not appear any longer, mainly out of the reason not to scare off Berlin right away at the very beginning. So the first reaction from Berlin was, we had nothing to do with it, of course not, but what an interesting approach. And they see it, and this is, again, that's a very typical Berlin reaction, always try to be modest and sit in the middle of the, of the discussion. What an extreme view. 
it's not an extreme view that Macron has laid out in his in his speech. I think it is a very it is it is a good kickoff, a kickstart for a highly necessary debate we have never had in Europe at that level. Will it be res we will see. Will we see reactions right away from Germany? God, no, because out of the reasons you have just, you have just, you have just, you have just laid out, it's, it's, we are in a limbo for the next three to four months to come because forming four, four party coalition is hard enough. Second point, which adds an element of skepticism towards my good news, to my good news I've mentioned at the beginning, is when it comes to European convictions and future EU scenarios, the four parties that might form this coalition come from quite different planets. And getting and bringing them together and keeping them in a stable environment will be the first and foremost goal of a chancellor who has not come stronger out of the elections. So to expect a thorough, deep, visionary debate about Europe needs a lot of optimism. It's, um, and especially if you have such a weak constellation as it could be in Berlin, which is not a two-party constellation. Another last point of optimism, or last answer, or the last element of optimism is, at the same time, the chancellor has to work now on something which in political terms you may call legacy. Mm. And I think she don't want to go into the history books only with the question of an energy transition after Fukushima. Uh, f for being the only the first female chancellor in Germany, for, yes, navigating the financial crisis properly, but also for being responsible for all the questions regarding the refugee crisis, whether it's true or not, but that's something how she's been seen by many today. So there is a chance that we might see impulses coming from her for the wider European question, but there's not a lot of time. So that's the mix <coughs> we are in right now. Um, I can only hope that we will have this debate you have had here in the 18th century with the Federalist Papers, which we, we've never had in Europe at that level, and we actually need it. Uh, well, with that, please uh, thank me and join me in uh, thanking our distinguished guests. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. thank you very much. Excellent.